Welcome everyone. We are in James chapter 2 this evening. Quiet group. Welcome, Donna. Good to see you. Uh, before we start, a couple things I want to pray about. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, slip a hand up and these guys will bring you a Bible over here. <clears throat> if you don't have a Bible, feel free to keep that. Consider that a gift from the Lord. Um, today is a hugely significant day in our nation, being 9-11. And, you know, I, I look out in the crowd and I think some of you guys weren't even alive. You know, and there was... All of that stuff for several years about never forget, never forget. And we are distancing, I mean, just the calendar is distancing ourselves from it. Um, there's so many ways that we do forget if you weren't there. If you were there, you remember exactly where you were at the time and all of that. But it was thinking about it last night, thinking about what it was like 18 years ago, the night before, for people when they just thought tomorrow was going to be a normal day and they were going to work. And, and the other thing that we tend to forget is not only did we lose thousands of people that day, but the lives that we've lost since then from the first responders. I think we've actually lost 10 times the number of police officers since that date from that event. Firefighters, I think we lost 300 and something that day, maybe 347 or something. And we've lost almost 250 since then. Um, from health health effects and all that. So I want to pray for those families tonight. And then real sad information too. Um, Jared Wilson was an associate pastor. You guys are familiar with Harvest Christian Fellowship and the church Greg Laurie pastors. Uh, Jared was uh, an associate pastor there, 30 years old. Uh, he and his wife, Julianne, um, started an outreach ministry called Anthem of Hope. And Jared struggled for many, many years with depression, and um, he died Monday night as a result of suicide. So always concerned. Um, he's got two boys and all that, but also being over a ministry like that that deals specifically with that situation, the impact that that can have, not just on his family, but his extended family. So I want to kind of cover those things in prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, we just uh, kind of begin with the remembrance of a, a distant tragedy and ongoing for those victims of 9-11 of that are continuing to suffer. And we think of uh, the Wilson family and the Harvest uh, Christian Fellowship family. Lord, just uh, the word says there is a time to mourn. And we, we do that with our brothers and sisters and ask that you would be with his wife, Julianne, and son, uh, Finch, and Denham, and uh, just extended church family, and all those that have been impacted by that ministry, Lord, that you would be the comforter that you are, Lord, that you would do what only you can do. And Lord, as a, as a nation, we're so grateful for our freedom that we have, freedom to be able to gather like we do tonight, and just go through your word and pray and, and do this in a public place. And Lord, the, this week we've started doing the children's ministry edition and it's a loud conversation in the town as um, people show up and just excited and want to hear about what's going on. And it's all you. So we thank you for that. And Lord, we do ask that um, you would open our ears, ears to hear tonight. But as James exhorts that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, Lord, but we would be doers. So speak, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, back in chapter 1, he says exactly what I just prayed. Actually, chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then the explanation of the thing that he tags on there is says, deceiving yourselves. Be doers. Don't just sit in here and, and take it in and, and be deceived, thinking that's, that's enough or that's okay. So 
again, James, it's kind of the playbook of faith that is giving practical application to what authentic Christianity looks like. And today, this passage, James chapter 2, picking up in verse 14, faith without works is dead, is, is the title. So I'm, I'm going to read through this passage, um, this kind of chunk, the second half of, of this chapter. And then I just I want to talk about it a little bit. I've, I don't know how far we'll get. I've got a lot of different cross-references to kind of tie this together. But it's, I won't say it's a controversial piece of Scripture, but it's a, it's a passage of Scripture that creates a ton of debate within the church. So let me just read through so you can kind of get big picture, then we'll go through it. What, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed, and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, If you have faith, and I have works, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe, and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and that by works his faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James is saying that it is impossible for someone to have faith and to not have it evidenced by works in their life. That you can't have real faith and not have it showed. But he does say that someone could say that they have faith. So I, I would ask, what is faith? But the Bible actually gives us a definition of of faith in the first chapter of Hebrews. So let's look at that. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Later in that same chapter, down in verse 6, we find out that faith is a requirement in order to please God. We need to have faith, right? It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligent, diligently seek him. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. So the debate within Christianity is oftentimes James is laying on this works. There's got to be evidence. You got you to see your faith. And Paul says, you know, by grace you're saved through faith, not of works. And, and you'll, you'll find different people in the church kind of camping out in one extreme or the other. Now, remember who James was talking to here. He was talking about Jew, talking to Jews that were under the law and, and very much works-based that now came to Christ and were finding the freedom of grace. But somewhere in that freedom became hearers and really um, not doers. The, the works sort of departed. So how does all of this that James is saying balance out with Paul? And, and is there a, a conflict or a contradiction between the two? Or does one complement the other? Any, any thoughts on that? One complements the other. Okay, how so? Yeah, that's good. Let's go home. <laughs> that's it. In, in contextually, you know, if you look at Paul talking to people pre-conversion, 
you know, like you can work your butt off. You can do all of these things and it's not going to get you saved. You know, you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be able to do enough stuff. And, and James sort of after that conversion, after you have faith, that that like a real conversion will automatically result in evidence of that. He, he's saying you can't have, you can say you have faith, you know, but if it's real, it's going to be visible. You're going to, you're going to be able to see it. So Ephesians, Paul says this in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we can't brag about our works. Our works aren't going to get us saved, but it's by grace we've been saved through faith. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. But then it says we're created his workmanship for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're saved by grace through faith, but for good works. That there's, there's a purpose and, a, and an intent behind that, and then that we would walk in them. So there's, there's a saying, I'm not going to claim it as my own because uh, I, I don't actually even know where it originated, but faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. You know, it has good works with it. So faith alone saves, but faith that saves is not alone. There's evidence of it. Paul also wrote, in uh, Titus 3.8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly, he says, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works, that there should be evidence of that. And so you got this debate within the Christian world and this argument, which I think wastes a lot of time, and I think the enemy uses it. But then we look at the words of Jesus that I think are equally as strong in, in the book of Matthew. Matthew seven twenty six says, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So those that hear and don't do, it's like a foolish man. It, further in, verse, in uh, chapter 7 in Matthew, again, our Lord Jesus says, in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lost lawlessness. Pastors. That have done all these things. Actually, a good example on Sundays, we're in the book of Acts. And it was in uh, chapter 8. Simon, right? Remember, Simon the sorcerer comes along and, and he professes faith. And actually went through with a religious exercise and got baptized. And then se sees the Holy Spirit, the, the apostles laying hands on people. And the Holy Spirit comes upon him. He's like, how do I buy that? You know, and Peter recognizes, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's, he's just doing stuff here, but there's not real, true faith. So Jesus says, if, it, if it's just that, if it's just works, I'll declare to you, I, I never knew you. Back in James, verse 14, he asks this question, what does it profit my brother? And if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can faith save him? It's a good question. What, what does it profit? What good is it, is what he's saying, right? What good is it if someone says that he has faith? You know, that he, that he makes a profession of faith, that he raises his hand and, and claims to be a Christian. You know, you guys have all had conversations with people that say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't do this, or I don't do that, or I'm not this, or I'm not that. And, and he's saying, what profit is there what good is it if someone says they have faith, but they don't have works? Can faith save him? Or can that kind of faith save him? Save him? What profit is it? What profit is it if I say 
that I'm an expert marksman, or I, I tell you this, but then you see me on the... Actually, better example, those of you that went on the hike with us. You know, there was a, there was a section there, remember, that, that second pond where we wanted to get to this other side where there was that granite beach and there was a stream growing across. I was like, how many of you believe that I could carry you across that stream? Or, or that Jim could, or, or one of the other guys. It, Matt, you know, Katie, do you believe that I could carry you across this? Yes, I believe. Well, jump up in my arms. <laughs> it's a different thing. The doing is a different thing. You know, Nicole certainly thought I could, but she didn't trust me enough to actually demonstrate faith, you know? So she got her feet wet. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. So he asks that question, and then he gives an example. So if a brother or sister is naked, and they, they are destitute of food, they don't have any food. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled. But you don't give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? What, what good is that? Do we need a practical example of that? What does it profit? If our faith is not an active faith, if it's not observable, I mean, and, and look at the answer, really. I mean, when you break down this scripture, right, back it up. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, they're hungry, food, clothing, and shelter. They don't even have the basics. And you say, be blessed. Or you say, I'll pray for you. You know, I mean, you look at some, I won't name them, but you look at some of these humanitarian ministries. You know, and there's always a debate like, well, this side is really just about feeding hungry kids, and I don't know how much they preach the gospel. And this other one is like, you can show up and we'll pass out literature and Bibles and stuff, but we're not going to feed you. You know, he's saying if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, they don't have the basic essentials that you need, and then your answer to them is, depart in peace. And look, look at the rest of that answer. Be warmed and be filled. So it's not even that you're ignorant of their daily need, right? But be warmed so you see that they don't even have clothes, it, so, but you say it. Be warmed and be filled. I know your belly's hungry, but God bless you. And let's pray for your empty belly rather than getting them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something, you know. What profit is it? What good is it? more damaging. How so? Right, if the, if the church is the body of Christ, we're the hands and feet of Jesus here, and we see somebody in hunger and in need, and we go up there with our Christian hat on and our vest that says we're a super Christian, and, you know, turn them over, wake them up, and hand them a track, but don't help with any of those needs, it, it could actually be worse, right? Okay, so what profit is it? No profit, maybe some hurt if you're not even meeting their needs. When, when your blood sugar drops and you're hungry and, and all of that and somebody wants to talk to you about something, you're not even hearing them, are you? You know, you're focused on the real need and somebody wants to give you advice, somebody wants to give you counsel and you're just gone. So what is it profit is the question. And then... Um, Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And then more words from Jesus in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. We've talked a lot lately about, I can't see your heart. All I can, all I can measure is, I can hear your words and I can see your actions, but he's saying even these, even these bad guys, even these wolves, will know it, will know them by 
the evidence of their works, right? We'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Gathering, I, I showed Ron a picture of my apple trees that he turned around a few years ago helping me. Um, what did you help me do? Prune them, right? Cut away the dead branches. And right now it's very evident that those trees are alive. But in, in three months from now, and I, you know, it's like, where is the life in that tree? You look at that tree, there's zero leaves on it. The bark is black, you know, and, and, and there's nothing on there. We, we know that tree is alive when it's full of fruit this time of year. And, and he's saying, these wolves, you'll know them by their fruits. And in the same way, the world will know us by our fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Interesting. One of the discussions I read kind of concerning this is, you know, if there was a, an outsider, I was actually talking to one of the teens from youth group um, way before youth group yesterday when he showed up. But he, he was saying, I'm not Christian. You know, I'm not Christian. I'm agnostic. Like, I'm, I'm just kind of figuring out. I was like, that's awesome. You know, then you, you're kind of seeking and you want to know what the truth is, at least. And I sure wish I could remember what I was going to say about that. Hmm. No idea. It's gone. Wow. Hmm. Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit probably. <laughs> no idea. Don't get old, brother. Don't get old. Yeah, no, I know. I, I shared much of the conversation with Rosaire. Let me back up a second. Even so, good, good fruit, bad fruit, evidence. No idea, man. Let's keep going in the word, though. My stuff doesn't matter anyways. Back in James, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. So he's kind of setting up a debate. If there was two people and they were saying these different things, um, you have faith. I just remembered. And if I don't say it now, I won't remember. But I'm going to try to finish this. You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And, and it's relevant to this verse, really. Because So what if there was an agnostic? Or what if this kid showed up again Sunday, and he came in here and he heard the word of God, and he heard and just kind of observed, like he said, I'm not Christian, but I'm willing to check you guys out and see if this is true. And he came in and he kind of took a snapshot of what our religion was Sunday morning. You know, here's what they teach, here's what they say, here's who they are Sunday morning. And then, what if he watched our life Monday through Saturday? You know, what if Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he tracked with us outside of this building? It, it, would, would, he, would he say, this religion is this, and the religion that they practice is something else? You know, or would he, would he look at our lives and be like, Oh, I get it. You know, this, this happened Sunday and this is living it out. You know, I think, I think that's where James is at. He's like, if, if it's real, if your faith is real, then it will be an active faith. You can't have active faith and, and not live it out. You can't have active faith and not have apples on your tree, you know, real fruit in your life. That it would be evident. So, th like, that's great explaining that to the non-Christian. Like I said, Paul kind of talking about you can work your butt off. It's not about that. It's faith in Jesus. And then James saying, if your faith is real, you, you, you're going to have works. But, you know, for the Christian, what about us? You know, what about this religion that we profess and these things that we say that we believe? Are, are they real in our life? You know, do we love God with all our heart, mind, and soul? Do we love his people? Do we have a love for his word? Do we have an appetite to to be in the fellowship of others? Do we have an appetite to, to read the scriptures and to just praise and worship him in every way that we can? Do we, do we uh, ask him to search us and see if there's anything in us that's unpleasing to him? Do we look for ways to worship him? And 
And probably we could all say, yep, sometimes. You know, hopefully most of the time. It'd be glorious if it was all the time. But, you know, those are the things when, when he's talking about there should be evidence or there should be works. If it's not there or if it's sometimes, or I feel like it's sometimes, but not most of the time, then, then it's like, well, when does that start to line up with everything that Jesus talks about being lukewarm? You know, if you're hot sometimes and cold sometimes, that's lukewarm, right? So we can, we can balance Paul's teaching with James' teaching and say, what does what I believe look like in my own life? And are they consistent? Or do what I profess on Sunday morning and then I'm, I'm hanging with the wrong crowd during the week or I'm going to places I shouldn't be going or I'm doing what I shouldn't be doing or watching what I shouldn't be watching? You know, is what kind of fruit am I showing? Is there evidence? Are there works in my life? That's really between you and the Lord. But verse 19 says, if you believe that there is one God, you do well. So now he's, he's talking about a different faith, right? He says, if you believe that there's a God, because if you, if you believe, then you're saved, right? That's what we teach. That's what we believe. But then he says, well, there's this belief like a head knowledge that God, God exists, you know, you, God, guns, and country, right? Hoorah, that's being an American. So if you believe that there's one God, he says, good job, you do well. But guess what? Even the demons believe that. And you know what? They're not saved. They're not going to heaven. So he says, good job that you believe in God. The demons believe, and they actually go a step further, and they tremble. They fear God. So there's a difference between the faith of demons and just kind of having a belief about God in your head and real faith, right? John 6, uh, 28 and 29 says, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? So how do we, how do, we do the works of God, not just man's works? And, and, wow, that just skipped ahead. Jesus answered in verse 29 and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Like, that's, that's all the work we have to do, is believe in him. And then as a result of a true belief in him, he'll do this stuff through us. It'll be evident, it'll be obvious. Be, and I say that, I, I put this in here, because we've got all kinds of different backgrounds. And if you're sitting here listening or, or you're online listening and you have this legalist inside of you, then it's so easy to go through the book of James and be like, and, and even that, what I just said, how does, your, how does your life measure up to your faith and all that? And it's like, it's so easy to get, I'm blowing it. I'm not doing enough. And if I don't start picking up my works, I'm not going to make it. You know, he's saying our, our work is to love Jesus and believe in him. And as a result of that, true belief there we will have an active faith first uh, John 1 6 says if we say that we have fellowship with him so this is, this is I'm trying to tie James and Paul all together here if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth first um, John 2 3 through 6 now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments so you don't know my heart. I don't know your heart. The only thing you can observe is my walk and the evidence of my faith, right? But if you're not that legalist and you're just measuring your, your belief against your life, it's easy to question, am I really saved? Is there enough evidence in my life? You know, or times where you're not, wait a minute, he said, if I, if I have a love for God above all things and I love my neighbor and I, I love being in his word, well, today was kind of a real struggle. And yesterday I didn't even do it. You know, can't we get to this point where it's like, by this we know him, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You know, it's another measuring tool that like, okay, I am doing these things. This is evidence in my life. This is real. God is changing me. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. 
He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. That's how we abide in him. James ends with this. Do you, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then he gives two examples. He gives an Old Testament example, actually both Old Testament examples. Um, Abraham and Rahab. So he gives a, actually a Hebrew example and a Gentile example. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Anybody get that? Anybody know what he's talking about with Abraham? Can you give me a biblical example of that? Perfect. We know that Abraham had faith because he took action on what God told him to do. So that action, if you remember, oh man, I don't, I don't, I don't know the exact chapters. Genesis nine, ten, something like that. Abraham received this promise, right? Look up into the sky, look at the stars, and and you're going to have that many offspring. You're going to be the father, not just of many, but of many nations, right? And at the time. He's an old man. It's impossible. But then we find out that God fulfilled that promise and he gave him a son. And then his son, it, well, actually, Abraham believed God, right? And it said there back then that it was accounted to him as righteousness. So by faith right there, it's accounted to him as righteousness. But then there came a time later, like 30 years later, that his son was older Remember, and, they, he, and he takes him up, takes like a three-day journey up to Mount Moriah. And the guys that go with him, he says, hang tight right here. Me and my boy are going up to worship God, and we're coming back down. But what did God told him to do? To sacrifice his son. To sacrifice his son. And, and he goes up, and he lays his son down on the altar. And Abraham accounted him as sacrifice to God. You know, he was willing to. In fact, we, we, we read that he lifted the blade and an angel stopped him and all that. And, and at that point, his faith, not that his faith wasn't real earlier, but it was evidenced by anybody else there, certainly evidence to his son because he took action on his faith or was willing to take action on his faith, right? And, and live that out. So then we have this other example, a Gentile, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? So they come into Jericho, or before they come into Jericho, um, the two spies were sent in, right? And they come to her house, and she hides them out. And, and then um, she's not going to be destroyed if she puts a cord in her window and all that. And so many interesting things about this. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified? Um, so what happened then? They come in and she lied, right? That they weren't there. She was hiding them out. So is, is God saying, be a liar like Rahab? You know? No, but her action, same thing what, what Rosaire said, because her faith, it was like, I've heard of your God. You know, I've heard of your God. I've heard your God is real. And, and because she believed, even a Gentile at the time, resulted in her taking action that put herself at real risk, evidencing that she had real faith. You know, I believe we'll see her in heaven. I don't think that when we get to heaven, when you're like, I want to know the rest of that story, where, where is Rahab? I don't think she'll be called Rahab the harlot. You know, that, isn't that so much like us? So much like the church that we would identify somebody by who they were or their sin or 
I mean, how often do you do that? You see somebody and it's like, oh, I, I know him. He's the guy that whatever. We'll see somebody that hasn't been in church in 10 years and they'll come back. And, you know, we're listening, but you're evaluating because you know them as the, like James I, I, or uh, Thomas. I don't think, well, where's Thomas the doubter? You know, there's no doubters in heaven. And we won't be identified in that way. And I don't think she will be either. So he gives these two practical examples from the Old Testament. Um, so I guess that's the question is what does your faith look like? You know, the kind of faith that you have. Do you have a dead faith? You know, when he talks about that in uh, verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Think about that. The body without a spirit. Unfortunately, I've seen that many times. But in, in the last moments of life, when, when life ends and the spirit leaves that body, there is no life left in that body. You know, and, and James is saying to that extreme, faith is just like that. When you say you have faith, but there's no evidence of that in works, it's dead. It's lifeless. It's valueless. So do we have that kind of faith? And, and I don't, looking out here, knowing you guys, I don't believe anybody here has a dead faith. You know, I don't know who's watching online or who might watch this after the rapture or whatever. Do you have a dead faith? Is it just a profession? Are you, are you counting on that you said you believed? You know, that you, that you raised your hand at a, at a camp when you were seven? Or, or you, you walked forward in a church when you were 27, but then you walked out the door and there was never any evidence of that at all. You know, or, or you're relying on the fact that you did that, but there's no evidence of it in your life. That's not a safe place to be. James says faith without works, without evidence, is a dead faith. You know, or... or, or is there a demonic faith, you know, or how he relates that in that you believe with all your heart that there is a God, but you don't know him. You don't have a, a relationship with him. You don't, you haven't entrusted him for your salvation. The, de the demons believe and tremble, but yet they're not saved. Is my life, is the life that I live a contradiction to what I say that I believe? That's a dead faith. You know, do I have a love for God? Do I have a love for his word? Do I have a love for his people? Or, or am I lukewarm in that? That's not a safe place to be either. Um, genuine faith is dynamic as a result of that faith. And, and again, if you've got that tendency or if you were raised in a legalistic religion, the, the goal is not to hear this and be like, I got to go out and work harder. You know, it's, it's to go before the Lord and measure. Lord, what, what, do I need, what do I need to change? What can I do? How can I be used? And be in his word, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Abiding in Jesus is how we develop and grow an observable, genuine faith. One last quote I'll leave you with. I thought this was pretty cool. Charles Spurgeon I don't know where it was from, but this is attributed to him. He's reported to have said, the grace that does not change my life will not, change, will not save my soul. So by grace, you're saved through faith, not of works. But he says, the grace that doesn't change my life will not save my soul. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this exhortation and thank you for the balance of it in scripture, Lord, that we wouldn't read this and be confused that we're saved by the stuff that we do. And, and we've got to do more and more and more and more. But Lord, the balance of the scriptures and, and the reminder, I think so much we, we celebrate grace, Lord, and, and we want to hear and we want to learn and do all this stuff. But in the very first chapter, James says, don't be deceived. Don't be hearers only, but be doers. Live this out. That's what you've designed this for. So we thank you for this reminder, Lord, and, and ask that you would keep it in the forefront of our hearts and minds. And Lord, when we see true need, 
even though there's scams and we're skeptics and all that, Lord, that we would look at the true need of, that's been presented in, in front of us, Lord, and try to meet that. Let you use us in that. And although we may be burned at times by people, Lord, we'll never be burned by you. We'll never be burned in serving you. So, Father, be our guide. Give us discernment as we live out our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you guys. Remember, Saturday is the uh, men's conference at Orrington. Uh, real good speakers there. I think it'll be a blessed time.